So we start our Christmas journey today. I wonder if that seems a little early to you. I don't know. Quick poll. Who of you have got Christmas decorations up in your house already? Like 10 of you? Come on. So, I mean, there's always this thing like how early is too early to put up your Christmas decorations? The shops get it too early October. That's too early, guys. But, uh, you know, I'm married to an American, and, and they just have a system, they have a standard. There's a defined day. It is the day after Thanksgiving. That was last week, Thursday. We celebrated that, which means, guys, you are free. Put up your decorations. That's why they're up in the church, et cetera. As we start to do, actually, I must just confess, our decorations in our house were up like a month ago. <laughs> Christmas is like, it's 2020. We're doing Christmas for as long as possible. So we're starting our Christmas journey sermon series today. And I'm gonna start by reading a Christmas uh, themed passage. But I'm gonna bet that you're not gonna recognize it as a Christmas passage. It's not one that we traditionally would look at around Christmas time. Because this passage does not tell us the story of how Jesus was born. We'll get into those narratives and that journey a bit later. This won't tell us about the birth of Jesus. This passage talks about how the birth of Jesus changes us today. And I'm not even meaning in terms of its gospel centrality of God finally coming to earth at the fullness of time in order to ultimately suffer and die in our place. That's also gonna be, that's gonna come up a little bit later, I'm talking about something else, about how the very description of God entering humanity, how that story takes place, the story we're so familiar with, but an aspect of the story that changes how we live today. See, there's one idea that should jump up out of us every time we read a Christmas story, Every time we look at a nativity display, it's one idea that honestly should hit us in the face. It's uniquely Christian. It's something that has the potential to transform our lives and the lives of the world around us if we could comprehend it and if we could live the way that it is describing. This one idea that I'm talking about is humility. You actually cannot think about the Christmas story itself without confronting the idea of just humility. It's there, it should hit us in the face. Let me read to you the passage that we have today and you can tell me what you think. So Philippians 2, we're gonna have a look at verses one to 11. Tells us, it's not a narrative about how Christ was born, but how that birth of Christ changes us today, should change us. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Just pause there for a second. Sometimes there's these little sentences in the Bible. They feel like if we just did that, how much different would life be? Right? Let each you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. And now verse five, the part that we're really gonna focus on this morning, because it tells, it is a description of the Christmas story. God coming to earth in human flesh. So carrying on verse five, it says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held onto, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, 
and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Humility is written into the very fabric of the Christmas story. Let's just play it out. What it is. Remind ourselves of the Christmas narrative that I'm guessing you know so well, but perhaps have missed just how stunning the idea of humility comes through in this. So first of all, that God would become human flesh. That's what this passage describes. Takes on the likeness of man. In doing so, had to empty himself and take on human flesh. We all know that, right? But just, just imagine. By now you know I've got overactive imagination. Let's do a little imaginative exercise again. So God is, is in heaven and he is about to deploy, he's about to send, send out his message to his angels. The time has come, the fullness of time has come. It's time to go to earth, let's kick this plan off. And word gets out to the angels that the plan of God is going to involve God. And of course, the Trinity is this mysterious idea, but it involves God now gonna take on human flesh. And you can imagine you know, maybe a, the angels kind of saying, hey, hang on, what? You, divinity, God, omnipotent, omniscient, could be at all places at the same time. You're going to take on human flesh, that weak, fragile, sickly, susceptible to the stain of sin. You're going to take on flesh. To which God would say, why, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. To which then perhaps the angels might say, well, okay, I mean, you're God, you know what you're doing, but let's set this up for you then, right? Okay, let's make this grand entrance. We will part the clouds, we will be there with these trumpets, and you are gonna arrive on this chariot out of heaven, we'll just get flames going, we'll just set this all up for you, right? You'll make your entrance on earth as a human, to which God would say, no thank you, I intend on entering humanity as a little baby. The baby. I mean, it's marvelous about the Christmas. We know God came to earth, but I mean, he came as a baby, that's what Christmas is all about. But it's stunning that God would do that. And it was prophesied always that this is how God would do it. Isaiah 9, verse 1 to 7. Again, these are familiar Christmas passages, but maybe not in a way that we're used to. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. The government on the shoulders of whom? A little baby, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice it does not say, for to us, a warrior has been trained up and released to us to rescue us from oppression. It says, for to us, a child was born, a needy, screaming, dependent, crying child, his parents have to carry them out the auditorium, right on cue, thank you. I mean, I was sometimes, carol service next week, and by the way, if you're planning on coming to carol service in person, spaces are filling up real quick, ad break, over. But some of the things we sing, you know, at carols, I love getting Christmas spirit, it's all great, but like some of these carol, carols just don't quite make sense to me. Silent night. Holy night, it was not too long ago that I was at the bedside of a woman giving birth to a child, my wife. It was not silent. 
or away in a manger. Gosh, come on now, that one line, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Are you kidding me? This is a normal baby. Babies cry, they need their nappies changed. You know, God in human flesh, he's still, you know, was a baby, a fragile, needy, dependent. This is God ultimately coming to suffer in our place, die the death that we should have died, but he chose to do it by entering humanity, taking on fragile human flesh as a little baby. That should shock us that God would do that. That's what Philippians 2, 5 to 11 is reminding us of, how stunning that is. So C.S. Lewis contemplating on this, he puts it like this. He says, the second person in God, the son, became human, was born into the world as an actual man, a real man of particular heart, hair of a particular color, speaking a particular language, weighing so many pounds. The eternal being who knows everything and created the universe became not only a man, but before that, a baby, and before that, a fetus inside a woman's body. Then he says this, if you wanna get the hang of it, think of how you would like to become a slug or a crab. That's correct, C.S. Lewis just call us all slugs. But that's, he's trying to get a sense of, this is what God did, he emptied himself. Here's how that translates from divinity and the glory of God, taking on human flesh as, as a baby. But that's not all. Again, angels like, okay, is this how we're playing this? All right, you're gonna take on flesh, you're gonna be born as a baby. So clearly, this is gonna happen in a palace in Rome, the seat of power. I mean, of course, this baby. It's not any baby, to which God will say, well, no, actually. I'm gonna to come to earth as a baby in a dumpy little village in the middle of nowhere that nobody's ever heard of to be born in a stable, which is more likely like a cave or perhaps even, we don't quite know, but perhaps even like the courtyard of that hotel, like kind of where people would park their camels or donkeys, i.e. a parking lot. The Christmas story, at the heart of it, everything, everything about the Christmas story points towards humility. He emptied himself, took on the likeness of man. Again, this is stunning. It's what makes Christianity so absolutely unique. There's nothing like it. So Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, speaking of the, I mean, just thinking about Christianity, the way it's spread and all that it's achieved and commenting on this, how it started, he says this, he said, if our goal, what it was, if our goal was that in 2,000 years from now, 75% of the human race will know our name, 25% of the human race will, will center their entire lives around us, this is Christianity, that our body of teaching will be the most influential in history, whole civilizations will be built on our vision for flourishing, our strategy would not include being born among farm animal urine in a stable, in a little town, in the middle of nowhere, and then spend our life outside all the networks of economic, political, and academic power, get no credentials, then get executed early in our career as an absolute disgrace. That would not be our plan for how to achieve all that Christianity has achieved. Yet this is how God chose to do it. He chose this way, the way of humility, deliberately. He chose this way. He came 
not as a power play of politics, not as a stupendous display of physical strength, nor military genius, nor charismatic entertaining ability, nor heroic feats of athleticism, nor accumulation of wealth, nor any of the forms of influence or power that we think about today. He chose this way, a way marked by one thing, one idea, humility. Do you see? It's the Christmas story. Humility. Now, please will you have a look at verse 5. So turn in your Bibles or tap on your phones. Just have a look at verse 5. I'll give you a moment. Because today I'm not really going to do like this deep dive on this whole passage. What I want you to see is the Christmas story, but through the lens of Philippians 2, see humility in the story, and all I want you to see is verse five. Read with me, this is what it says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Christians, have this same mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let me read it another way, an equally accurate way to translate this sentence. Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. I mentioned that one to you because crazy, we are being invited in this passage, we are being invited to see into the mind of Jesus. Have this mind, which is also the mind of Jesus. What do we find when we enter into the mind of Jesus, the mind of God? What we find is, as carries on in that passage, a description of humility. have this same mind, it's the mind of Jesus. This is what God is like. This is who God is. This Christmas story that includes this stunning detail about humility is not God just making a neat statement that is countercultural. This is who God is. Now again, let's just pause for a second because that is stunning. If anyone in the universe has a right to walk around with a swagger, it's God. Creator, omnipotent, omniscient, holy, majestic, you have no rival. You have no equal. Preach it, brother. <laughs> Humbled. Servant. Emptied. That should shock us. Listen, make no mistake about it. God is full of grandeur. That's what this describes as well. God is full of grandeur, but not grandiosity. God is full of grandeur, but not grandiosity. Isn't that a cool statement? I didn't come up with it. Someone else did. Write it down. It's describing majesty of God, but he emptied himself. He is devoid of any posturing, any displays of wanting to garner attention, any of these other aspects of pride. Full of grandeur, but not grandiosity. Now you have this mind among yourselves. This is really just so simple, which is also in Christ Jesus. Have the same mind same attitude, 
same posture, live with the same radical idea, same shocking worldview. So when we ponder Christmas and we come to carols next week and look at nativity scenes and watch Christmassy movies and things, what we should be seeing is humility and be thinking to ourselves, have the same mind, that's all. Well, not quite that easy, is it? In fact, it will take a little bit of a Christmas miracle for us to comprehend and live like this with humility because, because the human ego and the human ego is a powerful force of nature. And I know because I have one too. It's like we walk around with this black hole that just wants to suck attention, recognition, acknowledgement, affirmation, praise, and just sucking it from people around us. And it's never satisfied. It's a vacuum that cannot be filled. And we orient our lives around garnering the sense that I'm valuable, have meaning. I deserve to be recognized and noticed and thought of as intelligent, as worthy. The human ego is a powerful force of nature. We're completely dominated by it. Work ourselves to death to just to feel like we have the sense of value. Orient our relationships and our lives. And even our emotional state is dependent on, if you thought about it, if you're feeling very affirmed by others, you're happy. How do you feel when you're criticized? Moody, immediately. That's the, that's the human ego, a powerful force of nature. And Christmas comes like a rocket to destroy that. And it should, because this is how God chose. This is how God chose to transform humanity and draw humanity to himself. Have the same mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, so how do we do this then? If it is this powerful force of nature, how do we take it on? Well, there's one main way, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But I think what I want to do is just let's deconstruct the human ego for a little bit. Because it sounds all intimidating, and to be sure it is powerful, but let's deconstruct it. And Scripture helps us to do this. So 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, you don't have to turn there, you don't have to read it. But it's interesting, as Paul talks about pride here, he uses a very interesting word for pride. Normally it would be kind of the word hubris, which is a cinnamon, that, cinnamon, cinnamon, that same kind of word. <laughs> but he uses a different word. He uses physio, this Greek word physio, and it's interesting. He uses it over five times in these two chapters Use it in Colossians as well. And this word physio, it's this picture of something that is overinflated, like a balloon that's been blown up, but way, like it's about to pop. When you just touch it, it's gonna burst. It's also the idea of, of like an organ of the body that has been distended. So much air has been pumped in, it's swollen. It's the same word behind bellows, you know, the thing that you would old school like to make a fire, like, you yeah. know, no, think of balloon, let's just go with balloon. It's a very evocative image, it's, it's like it is, he's picturing it as an organ that is so sick, it's distended, it's swollen, it's fragile, sensitive, you touch it and it's just, it's painful. That says Paul, that's the natural condition, that's the human ego. If it had to be an organ, that's what it would look like. That's what it would be like. Which is helpful when deconstructing this human ego for a couple of reasons. So firstly, it tells us just how sick, how sick the human ego is, actually. 
Have you ever wondered about, you know, the human body, that you never notice a lot of the human body until there's something wrong with it? For example, you don't quite walk around going, man, elbows are so cool. Huh? I mean, these things, you don't notice your elbow until you hit it, you hit the funny bone. Then you're like, oh, I have an elbow, you know? Parts of the body that draw attention to itself is because there's something wrong with it. Now, think about, we're thinking about ego as like this organ of the body. Think about how often is your ego hurt? Let me put it another way. How often do you get your feelings hurt? And by the way, there's no such thing as hurting feelings. It's your ego that gets hurt and you have these feelings as a result. Like, Perhaps the question is, how many times per hour? And if it's hurt all the time, yeah, that, this picture of this distended, overinflated, sickly thing, you just like look at it the wrong way. Ignore the WhatsApp message, you know? And, and it's hurting, which shows how sickly it is. It's not powerful. It's sick. And empty, full of air, it's actually empty. It's this thing that says a lot, it's always complaining. It's sore, demands so much attention, but it's empty. So the word that Paul uses here in Philippians, do nothing in verse three from selfish ambition or conceit. The word conceit is vain glory, empty glory. That's human pride trying to garner glory, but it's empty. There's no substance to it. And just think about it. Does our constant need for attention when we slide these tidbits into conversation to make people think of us in a different way? Like, would you walk away feeling so satisfied or empty? Has it ever worked? Has the human ego ever worked? In fact, what we would see if we look at human history is that the devastation of human history comes off the back of the fragile human ego, isn't it? Wars, genocides, brokenness, economic injustice. Comes back to this empty, yet fragile, loud, weak, sickly organ. So all that to say, why would we live and orient our lives around this sickly, inflated, fragile part of our humanity? The quicker we ditch it, the better. Amen? Pastor Ray Ortland who I think was the guy who said that smart thing that I said earlier. He says this, he says, what's wrong with me and with you and the whole world today is our pride and self-importance and need to be stroked and pitied and envied and fussed over. The humility of God declared to us every year at Christmas tells us that our deepest problem is not our political philosophy or our social ideals or intellectual beliefs or even our emotional struggles. Our deepest problem is our self-obsession. Isn't that the truth? So that's some negative motivation for you. So let's deal with this pride, this human ego, this conceit. But here's some positive motivation why you would want to put that aside and embrace humility because the rest of Philippians describes as one of the greatest paradoxes in the world, the Christmas paradox. Is this that the way up is down? And in fact, pride humiliates us. Humility honors us. That's the Christmas paradox. Because look, it's here. It's the transformative power of God emptied himself, became a servant, took on the likeness of men, a baby, and then lived in obedience and even death on a cross. 
And that leads to, this is what it says. Therefore, verse 9 to 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed him in a name above every other name, so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow and tongue confess. That's the paradox. Pride humiliates us in the end. Humility honors us. And this message is all over the Bible and not just applied to Christ. This message is this, what works, what changes people, what changes society, what is transformative. It's not pride in the human ego, it's humility. It's what works. It's what actually makes a difference. For example, in the prophets, Isaiah 6, 6 verse 2 says, this is the one to whom I will look, says the Lord. Don't you want to be somebody that God looks at? I mean, it's this picture. I mean, he sees everything, but it's this picture. Here's the one that I'm going to pay special attention to, says God. Now we're listening. It is he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. I mean, forget about other people noticing you. Who cares? For God to look on us, especially. It's the one who's humble. The way up is down. Humility works. It's transformative in my own, in your own personal spiritual life. In the wisdom literature, it says in Proverbs multiple times, he has an example, verse 29, verse 32, 23, whatever. One's pride will bring him low. Pride humiliates us. But he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Humility honors us. Again, it's a one-liner. They would change the world. How about the words of Jesus? I mean, you've read these verses multiple times. This is what he would say. Luke 14, verse 11. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Pride humiliates us. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 18, verse 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child as Jesus did, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, guys, this is, I'm not telling you anything we don't know, I'm sure. This is basic to Christianity, but I don't see it in the world around me. I don't see it in Christians. I don't see it in my own life even, and we're worse off because of it. That's why we need the Christmas story every year, year on year. Not just to make us feel good, to shock us. Last thing, you know what's so amazing about this idea of humility as being kind of this, the entrance point into everything that is good and transformative for us and people around us? You know what's so good? Humility is so accessible. Anyone can get low. I mean, again, it was Ray Ortland who said, you know, if God made the standard love like something lofty, huge, we go, man, there's just no way I can love like you, but I can humble myself. When this passage says, have the same mind among yourselves, and goes on to describe the divinity of God, there's no way we could, actually, we could become like God in his divine nature, the thing that we can imitate, the part of God that we can imitate that we can truly live like is humility. This is the part that's accessible. I want us to get into a time of prayer now. But as we do, having said all these things, humility is accessible, deconstructed, what's holding us back. And it sounds so simple, but hey, if you're like me, we know this is just a, a grand battle. And the one thing that's left, to strike at the heart of our pride is to reflect not just on the Christmas story, which is a rocket that shocks us and reminds us, but to reflect on the Easter story as well. On the cross, simply, and the death, that's why Paul brings it up here as well. 
became obedient, even death on a cross. That was a humiliating way to die. Carries on the humility narrative. And bottom line is, there's nobody who can stand next to this, the cross and be arrogant. Is that possible? Oh, yeah, look at, you know. Nah. That's why we sing the words that wonderful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and sing it with me, pour contempt on all my pride. See, pride and the cross of Jesus are just are mortal enemies. You can have one or the other, really. Again, I'll leave you with this closing thought from Tim Keller. And he says, the gospel does not say the good are in and the bad are out. Thank goodness. That's not what the gospel says. The gospel doesn't say the good are in and the bad are out. The gospel says the humble are in, the prideful are out. Because at the heart of coming to Jesus is recognizing I can't do it. I can't live in the way it's, the heart of it is humility. That's how we get saved. So let's pray. And I pray that as we start this Christmas journey together, may Christmas bring this powerful idea of humility to your mind constantly. And may this journey from Christmas to Easter bring it to our hearts destroying our pride. And Jesus, we pray that as we enter into this special season, desperately needing the sentiment and the warmth that comes with it, but Lord, if there's one thing we ask for, it's that we would not miss what I believe you're trying to shout at us through this story. And that is the way of humility. May we have the same mind, which you've said in your word, is also ours in you, Christ Jesus. Meaning you have the ability to give us the same posture, the same attitude. And so we ask for it and receive by faith. ultimately coming before you, Lord Jesus, as those who are lowly in spirit, contrite of heart, acknowledging our need for you, for everything. We couldn't make it one second without your grace. Your grace has sustained us this year. Your covenant faithful love has covered us. We are completely and utterly in your hands for our lives now, and especially our eternal lives. There's no way we could ever dream of entrance into eternity in your holy presence without you having done this, coming to earth in a form of man, emptying yourself, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. A death we should have died, but you died in our place so we could be set free. And all we can do is say thank you. And God, may this come like a rocket and destroy our human ego, our selfish ambition, our vain glory, our conceit, our pride. We pray these things in your name. Amen.